Thank you. As a young girl, I admired the beauty and majesty of the rainbow. Its vibrant colors entranced me, and I often found myself wondering about the mystery of it. You see, I grew up in Macon, Georgia, a small town outside of Atlanta. Football and high school basketball was the Friday night fair. And Saturdays were spent cleaning the house and then hanging out at Crystal. And on Sunday, everybody went to church on Sunday, followed by a heavy meal. And if it was football season, I can tell you, I remember to this day, my mother standing up in front of the TV yelling and telling the Atlanta Falcons coach that he had called the wrong play. <laughs> but it was also a town of faith. And I learned that faith from my mother and my grandmother. They taught me the importance of that faith. You see, I'm the product of a single parent working class home. My mother, a God-driven woman, she raised me along with my three sisters to believe in no limits, to dream in possibilities. She actually empowered us to believe that with hard work and dedication, we could do or be whatever we wanted to do. So I marveled at these rainbows, not for the pot of gold that may be at the end, or those mischievous leprechauns that hang out there, but for a promise, a promise for a better tomorrow that was better than the day, and a promise that no matter how violent the storm, there was hope. Because you see, my mother knew about violence. That's why she flew, she flew away and left in the middle of the night with her three little girls, with me on her side, to protect us from the violence because she knew that destiny was not at the end of the rainbow. It was my early connection to faith and my mother's teaching that really propelled me through my studies. Not once did I question whether I could, could belong to a club or what my academic achievements could be. I loved math and science. So it was only natural that when my high school teacher said to me, you should go to Georgia Tech, I said, sure. So I left my little small, close-knit town for what looked like the big city, Atlanta, at that time, not knowing what was possible, but being very comfortable and satisfied nonetheless. I majored in chemical engineering. Now clearly I didn't really know what a chemical engineer did or what one looked like, but I knew that I loved math and science. So beginning my first summer, I started co-oping, cooperative education program at Procter & Gamble. But there was a problem. I didn't feel that stirring in my body. Didn't feel it in my belly. But I weathered my first co-op winter in Cincinnati, and I figured out something, that maybe I wasn't cut out for snow, <laughs> and maybe I wasn't cut out for chemical engineering either. But I kept pressing on because I had this passion for science and math. But I figured out something else about myself also as I was working in that plant and interacting with people, is that I also had a passion for people. So as I ended my cooperative education program and they offered me a job, I was really stressed because I knew I didn't feel that stirring, but clearly I was torn with my mother working here and working at a paper factory and me thinking about turning down a job. But I listened to her whisperings 
And I turned down that job because I didn't feel that fire in my belly. Now I was at a crossroads. Here was my future, here was my education, what was I going to do? I've always valued mentors and counseling. So I went over to Spelman to talk to them about going to medical school, to get some advice because Georgia Tech didn't have a pre-med program at that time. And frankly, my advisor thought I was crazy. And she said to me, I'll never forget this, the counselor said, you don't seem to know a lot about going to medical school. And I said, you know what? I didn't know a lot about being an engineer either. And guess what? Turned out okay. So I applied and entered Harvard Medical School. Now what would make a little country girl think that she could go to Harvard Medical School was again, remember those whisperings. Remember that this little girl believed in rainbows and knew that there was hope in the rays. And so I completed medical school and came back to Atlanta and did my residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Emory. And I was really beginning to feel that fire in my belly. Every patient encounter, every research experience, I knew that I was on the right path. My personal life flourished also. I married my college sweetheart, and as our careers blossomed, we brought in two wonderful children. Now from the outside looking in, looks like I got it all. Isn't that what it's about for us sometimes, women? We always are trying to stretch that elusive concept of having it all. But I can tell you one of the most freeing things for me has been the fact that as a career woman, as a mother, as a friend, that I've been able to let go of this concept of balance. There is no balance. <laughs> some days you give more to your career. Some days you give more to your marriage. Some days you give more to your children. Now don't believe that I don't believe it's possible to have it all, because I do. You just can't have it all at the same time. <laughs> now with all storms, that lead to rainbows, there's a quiet. And I was in my quiet place. My career was soaring. I was the chair of OBGYN at Meharry Medical College. I had this passion for women's health. I had focused my women's health issues on disparities in women's health. And then after being at Meharry for a short period of time, I started the Center for Women's Health Research at Meharry, the first center of its kind devoted to studying diseases that disproportionately impacted women of color. Then in 2006 came the storm. There was nothing in my life that could have prepared me for this storm. Remember, I was in full swing. It was quiet. And what happened on that day? The wave of sadness, fear, and anger. I still remember it as if it was yesterday. The call that I received that my mother had passed. What was I going to do? It was her wisdom that had protected me from the naysayers who said that I couldn't go to Georgia Tech or that I wouldn't be successful at Harvard Medical School. It was her advice that I leaned on when I had doubt. And even now when I sit in boardrooms and I'm the only person around the table that looks like me, I still reach out for her wisdom and her strength. What was I going to do? I almost felt like giving up. But in this haze, what did I do? Just like we always do, I took on another set of responsibilities. <laughs> I became the Dean and Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs. And I thought, this is my ray of hope. This is gonna help me through this. But my storm wasn't over. And four weeks later, I lost my aunt. And four weeks later, I lost my then president's son. And six weeks later, I lost my father, 
And then on the 4th of July, after my sisters and I had come together for some bonding, I received a call that my postdoc student had been killed in a car accident. I became a walking, functional, grieving zombie. And it took my husband reminding me one night after I went through my usual Sunday ritual of going into my bedroom, closing the door, and looking at this show. I don't know if you all remember it, brothers and sisters, a dysfunctional family. <laughs> but I would wrap myself in that show and cry. And he came in one night and he said, you didn't die when your mother died, and we need you too. So I did what I would have told my patients to do. I went to grief counseling. And with that, I was able to pull myself out of the fog and become functional again, and hopefully stronger. Now, remember, I was still looking for those rainbows, and I couldn't see them because my storm wasn't over. And my storm wasn't over because the school had hired a new president. And within a short period of time, guess what? That president decided that he didn't want me on his leadership team. Me, who in my mind <laughs> had been exceptional. Me, who in my mind had taken the school to heights that was gonna make it the highest paying school of value in America. Me, who at one point who had been the only or the youngest female dean in the country of a medical school, me, who now had that title of a terminated dean and senior vice president of health affairs. It was the first time that I really recognized what failure looked like in my career. But you know what? I remember the quote from one of my favorite authors that says, life has a way of testing a person's will either by having nothing happen at all or by having everything happen at once. And I will tell you, that allowed me to reconnect to my choice and my path of medicine. I connected back to my purpose. I connected back to why I chose medicine. And I asked myself some hard questions about value, about my purpose, and was that purpose aligned with my passion? And in 2011, the rainbow reappeared. I was afforded the opportunity to come back to Georgia. My passion for medicine, health, and healing led me to Morehouse School of Medicine, a school with humble beginnings that's devoted to improving the lives of individuals, diversifying the scientific healthcare workforce, and eliminating health disparities. In so many ways, it mirrored my heartbeat because I learned that it was dedicated to all the things that were important to me, producing phenomenal students and leaders who wanted to change the world. And I knew that with this research, it was fertile ground for the creation and advancement of health equity. So in September, when I stood on the stage, being inaugurated as the first female president and dean at Morehouse School of Medicine, I felt the pride of the entire room, the women in the audience, my family, my friends, the faculty, the students, and the staff. But most importantly, I could hear the whisper and feel the embrace of my mother. And she said, you followed your passions, baby. You are fulfilling God's promise and purpose for you. You allowed yourself to dream impossibilities and to not be limited. Will there be turning points in your life? Will there be twists and turns and interruptions? Yes, it will but I feel confident in saying that if you remain true to your passion and ensure that that passion is aligned with your purpose 
then you too can overcome barriers that are placed before you. Where statistics say you shouldn't be able to or politics say that you can't, you will find that you can and you will. And lastly, always remember that little girl who marveled at rainbows and found hope and healing in the rays. And yes, at the end of that rainbow, there is a pot of gold. Thank you very much.